Boxing King Media, powered by BYD. Eddie Hen, all the way in Philly. Um, I'm just going to jump in straight away, ask you about Jaron Ennis, because uh, the, the maddest thing is, I think I told you about him six, seven years ago. I remember sending you a DM saying, have you seen this guy? And you just gave it a thumbs up. Yeah, I mean, probably five years ago, the first meeting I ever had with his team was at the Canelo-Danny Jacobs fight, wow. which I think was like five, six years ago. And we were quite new then. And obviously we were there as Danny Jacobs' team. And everyone was saying, this kid is the future of the sport of boxing. Like, so obviously we tried to sign him. We got close a couple of times. And then eventually when we made the signing, the reaction's been incredible. And I think the promotion has been amazing for tomorrow, but there is also a surprise element of me to say, wow, 14,000 people in the Wells Fargo in Philadelphia for, you know, I mean, it's a great fight, Avenesian, but it's not Crawford or it's not, you know, of that magnitude. So the potential here is incredible. And I can't wait to watch this this young man up close tomorrow night. I think he's a generational great and um, hopefully he puts in the performance that shows it. Why didn't why didn't he sign with you before? Like, what were the reasons they were given? Was it because Mr. Hearns wasn't the go-to guy then or was it just the whole problem? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, um, I think... Back then, we didn't have the dates. We didn't have the budget. We didn't have, you know, I think it's prior even to the DAZN deal. And even when DAZN launched, there was always the naysayers. I think he had a lot of politics as well, sort of previous managers and advisors and promoters and stuff like that. So it's taken him a time to get free, if you like. And now we're there, you know, we're on the verge of being in those mega fights. And that's our job now to build off this momentum. Hopefully he looks great tomorrow night. And then, you know, we can make all the big fights that, that we need to for Jerron Ennis. I'm curious, why have you sold out 14,000 and promoters before him, like Al Heyman, people have talked about how he's got the US on lockdown, but he wasn't able to sell out them kind of numbers and you've done it on the, in your first go. I, I just, you know, I'm, you know, I'm always going to back myself and ourselves as a team, but we're just really good at what we do in that respect. We know how to go in and promote specifically in people's hometowns. Like, And I don't think, People just get lazy. Like, it does require a lot of work, but I think people just go, oh, we've got that venue in Vegas. We've got that there. We'll just go there. It, it, you know, rather than when we come to Philadelphia, one thing we said to Jerome was, he said, I really want to fight in Philly. But people told me that, oh, he doesn't really sell in Philly. I was like, how do you know he doesn't sell in Philly? He's never boxed there. But five years ago since he boxed there. Oh, you know, box, there's not really a lot of big time boxing in Philly. Well, is that that gives you an excuse to do a big fight, doesn't it? You know, oh, no, no. It's like, fuck the negativity. What's the biggest venue in Philadelphia? Where's the Wells Fargo? How many is that old? 20,000. Let's go there. Oh, are you fucking mad? What if it does four or 5,000? Yeah, but what if it doesn't? What if it does 15,000 and we take the first ever fight to Wells Fargo? Oh, so it doesn't always work out like that. Do you know what I mean? But it has this time and you've got to have the vision to actually, like people, it's a bit like Shakur. Shakur did a great gate in Newark last week. No one will tell you about it because they don't want to because he left. But, like, it, it works in your hometown. And, like you know, last week, Shakur done 10,000 or whatever it was. They didn't even really promote it. Imagine if they would have promoted it. So these places, like boxing in America is changing. We're really starting to understand the market. We're selling a huge amount of tickets all around all these shows now. And this is another example of that. It, and I'll point out, you did the same with Devin Haney and uh, Regis Progray. Yeah. That, that yeah. was then. What, what Subriel I'm... Matias, the other week in Puerto Rico, 9,000. I know Phoenix isn't Bam's backyard, but 9,000 in there for Bam against Estrada. Like we're selling a lot of tickets at the moment and we're in a good place. Solid numbers. And, you know, with regards to, because uh, that's your investment, you're signing Jaron Ennis and you've talked about Shakur Stevenson. And I, I read a quote earlier from you today. I don't know who you said it to, but Benson tweeted where, you said you'd put in the contract if he signed Shakur that you'd allow him to fight. You know, if he was going to fight Javonta, for example, you'd remove yeah. himself from it. So how does that benefit you? And yeah, It's a bit sad, like, because that's the poison of boxing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I mean? You would have seen Oscar De La Hoya's quotes last night where he said, I will only let him fight William Zapeda if he signs with Golden Boy. What the fuck's all that about? I mean, Zapeda's the challenger. So what you're saying, you will use Zapeda as a pawn and take away an opportunity of a lifetime for William Zapeda if Shakur doesn't sign with you. I mean, you talk a good game, you talk about working with other promoters, but really it's a poison of the sport, that kind of statement. 
But that's why I would remove myself from the situation because I just want the best for these guys and a chance for them to prove their greatness and show their greatness. You know, and that's if if people feel like they don't want me involved, it's pretty pathetic, especially when I can bring so much to the promotion. But if people are that insecure, so be it. Uh, you know, life's too short. So I just want to, I think Shakur can beat everybody around that weight class. But you need to make the fights. And it's not just about Williams or Pader. There. It's about Tank. It's about maybe Ryan Garcia. So maybe moving to 140. But look, people got to understand Shakur is a three division world champion. He's 27 years old. He ain't broke sweat yet, really. So let's see how great he can be. The reason I was asking is because I think it said that he was going to give him potentially a three-fight deal. Saying three fights, he wins all of them. The third one, he wins in great style. Then he's kind of ready for like, bang, he's a, he's a household name. Why would you risk losing him at that point? Yeah, I think so. But you just hope that you build a relationship where someone wants to stay with you. And I, I feel like, you know, I know loyalty's, you know, not often shown in boxing, but I feel like if you do a good job for someone, Generally, you've got a great chance of keeping them, you know. But I think you just got to be careful that you don't just make irrelevant fights because that's the thing that Shakur doesn't need. He needs good fights. It's a bit like Jerron after this, you know. Yeah, it's good to be active and everything, but where's the career-defining fights? And, and that's the pressure that you're under to deliver those. And the first time you mentioned Jaron Ennis, like quite robustly a few months ago when, you know, well, not a few months ago, a couple of years ago when Conor Ben's name was uh, being put towards uh, fighting Jaron. What's the latest with Conor? When can we expect to see conclusion? It's probably the most boring question you get asked. Yeah, definitely the most boring question. And um can't really give you the answer is the truth. I mean, you know, he's in his own conversations with his legal team and UCAD. It's very frustrating. It's been over two years now. And, you know, you've got other fighters that, Kind of just, it seems that if you accept your guilt, you get a shorter ban than you do if you fight for your innocence. Do you know what I mean? So, like, there's there's been a lot of people, and I won't mention them because they won't, you know, it won't go down very well, who have said to Connor, look, why don't you just say this and just, t it's like, that's a lie. It's like, yeah, but you get a shorter ban and it can all be over. He goes, no, I've not done anything wrong. I'm not going to accept guilt. I'm going to try and fight for my innocence. Unfortunately, that's just prolonged the situation. And now I think it's time to go in and have those conversations to go, guys, like, this is ridiculous. So how are we going to put an end to it? I think, the, you know, whether you think he's innocent or not, I think he's suffered enough. Do you know what I mean? And, and especially because I believe he is innocent. And, you know, if, if he is innocent, what's happened to him is unbelievably unfair. But it's life. And that sooner or later, we need to put a line under it and all move on. Chris Eubank Jr., you said, you know, you guys were quite far apart from negotiations. I don't, without giving us the actual numbers, I'm just curious if you were saying, I'm going to pay you 10 grand if we use, like, I don't know, smaller figures, how far apart were you guys? Just curious. It's more about the fights, to be honest with you. Like, he wanted two warm up fights, two gimme fights, if you like. And I don't mind one, but two, just, just like, so painful. Um, and Boxer were prepared, this is what he told us, Boxer were prepared to give him the two gimme fights. And, you know, he said to us, look, I'm going to do these two fights and then we'd like to do the Conor Ben fights. So I was like, go on, go and, go and do the two fights. Frank Smith had the conversations with his team. You know, I guess the Canelo conversations are going in the background. I think he would take that fight, but I know the number that he'd ask for. And commercially, it's not a big fight, particularly in America. So, I don't see him fighting Canelo, but if they pay the money, he, he would do it, I'm sure. It sounds similar to the Tyson Fury situation when you was about yeah, to... Yeah, yeah. I just think that, you know, with Fury, I remember with the conversations where he said he wants three fights, actually. And he told me about the opponents that he wanted to fight in the first two, like the level. I was like... Like... But if I would have known he would have done those two fights and then fought Deontay Wilder, I think it would have been very different. But it's just how much you're willing to invest in the shit fights, really. And you have to go through two shit fights with Chris Eubank now to get potentially a good one to make your money back. And it's how much you're how much you need that, if you know what I'm saying.
Last couple, uh, an Eddie Hen interview won't be complete if I didn't mention Carl Froch's late, latest uh, video. He, he did one with Peter Fury the other day. Uh, he obviously talked about uh, AJ and the Ruiz fight, which is one of his favourite fights to talk about, the first one. And he, he basically described it as he felt like AJ was shaking his head. He didn't want to be there. Um, and he, did, he feels like he won't like the fact that if somebody puts it on him. And then Simon Jordan's quoted PTSD. All these sort of things, when you're hearing that, what, what are you thinking? Because uh, basically what they're all saying, well, not all, but Simon Jordan and Carl Froch are saying when, if Dubois puts it on AJ, he could crumble. In, in the I, I think Dubois is a massive puncher. I think if he chins someone, they're going to be in trouble. What if AJ chins Dubois? I mean, technically, he's a much better fighter. But it's a heavyweight game. Anything could happen, you know. I think in the Ruiz fight, AJ was probably at about 50%. And, you know, three weeks out, we lost the opponent. We probably shouldn't have taken the fight, but we did. And if he don't get up after the left hook or he ends him there, no one ever mentions it again. Do you know what I mean? Actually, people would be saying Ruiz was shit anyway. Do you know what I mean? So you get beat, you get hit by a left hook on the top of the head that concusses you, mainly because you weren't 100%. You keep getting up. What do you get up four times? Like, I mean, he was concussed. I don't, I don't know. I just think if you can't appreciate what AJ has done with his life and his career, the resume that he's built and the fact that he's come back to this kind of form with the time that he's given to boxing in this country, with the role model that he's been, with the way that he's conducted himself, you've got no chance, have you? Like, what else can you do? I don't know why you would feel the need to criticise Anthony Joshua. Like, you don't have to be a fan, but to try and break down things that have happened and build a case and a story against him, it's weird. The whole it's people... Like, you know, I don't think there's a problem saying, yeah, look, you know, I think AJ's a good everyway, fair play, like what he's done is incredible, but I don't personally rate him that much. Mm -hmm. But to, to kind of like you know, go back to this happening and when he done that and when this happens and if that happens, this is going to like, uh, but that's, we, we live in a world of debate, don't we? People like conversation and people like controversy and views and, you know. Um, you know, Daniel Dubois doesn't kind of prove PTSD probably doesn't exist because the way he lost to Joyce, then he took Hergovic's best shots. He took, he went through a storm against Miller. So does that kind of prove fighters can overcome their moments? Look, AJ had a bad night at the office that night. He was ill prepared. Um, there was a change of opponent, and he made he made a mistake in a fight, and he got hit by a big heavyweight, and he got he got stopped. He's shown his chin over the years. Look at a Klitschko fight, even the Dillian White fight when he took that left hook. You know, he got buzzed, came back in the fight. Povetkin hit him with shots. Parker hit him with shots. You know, Usyk hit him with the kitchen sink. Never had him skating around the ring like Tyson Fury. Well, what, what, what's Fury's chin like? I know it's impregnable, isn't it? I mean, it's what everyone kind of says, but he never hurt AJ like that. He hit him with everything. Everything. Fucking 12 rounds in the first fight. So, you know, but but Dubois is dangerous. It's a dangerous fight. And it's a great fight. My last uh, boxing question is on Fury. Um, a lot of few people suggesting he needs, to, needs a new trainer. Do you think he needs a new trainer? And if so... Who would you suggest? I don't know. I, I don't know Sugar Hill well enough, but he, Sugar Hill's a very good trainer. You know, it, it's more about the relation. Sometimes you can have the best trainer in the world, but it's just not working with you guys, you know? And I think Rob McCracken's one of the best trainers in the world. And the job he done with AJ was incredible. But just after a while, you know, they sort of drifted apart a little bit, you know? And, and I think... As you evolve in life, what, what what works for you fight at that point doesn't work for you five years later, you know? AJ wanted something different. He had a couple of trainers, and now he's fine one, found one where he's 100% happy and he's firing on all cylinders. So Tyson needs the same thing. Only Tyson Fury knows, really, if you need to change trainer. But there's so many fighters that just don't change trainers and teams because a bit of aggravation and you know, I don't want the confrontation or whatever. But really, it's a short career. You have to make the right decision for you. And I'm sure 
Tyson Fury's experienced enough and he's got a team of people around him that will do right by him and and make any changes they feel necessary. My last question to you, Eddie, is uh, non-boxing related, but um, one of the all-time greats in his sporting field retired today. Do you know who I'm about? No, go on. You're a fan of the sport. You put, you're quite good at it. Cricket? Which yeah. ones? Oh, Jimmy, Jimmy Anderson. Yeah, we're going to make yeah, yeah. because I watch cricket, you know, the highest wicket taker, the um, most wickets for a fast bowler in test cricket. Yeah. That guy that's kept quite low key. And if you consider what you're saying, thing, really, like, I think that never been in the media. Yeah, I mean, tabloids. quite remarkable that a fight that a player, as he said, a fighter then, a player of that ability. And also, like, very marketable guy, good looking guy, like fast bowler, never really. Put himself out that way and i guess sometimes that can affect your legacy a little bit because maybe he's not at the forefront of your mind but when you actually look at what he achieved and you look at the way that people talk about him in the sport to to bowl that fast for so long like it's quite remarkable on the body but like, the fact that he was still playing and bowling and taking wickets at international level at that age quite remarkable so good luck to him and um sure he'll live a fantastic life now and, and his legacy will always be cemented within English cricket. Why why do you think he went under the radar? Because the reason I brought him up is because you could kind of compare him to AJ in the cricket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's per personal preference. Mm -hmm. Maybe he didn't want that kind of life. I don't fucking blame him, to be honest with you. I mean, sometimes I look, I mean, I don't think AJ wants that life. You don't? No, but like it's a life that is thrust upon you i mean cricket's a different kind of profile sport i think like to boxing but you know he was never the, the bad boy was he? he never went out i mean i'm sure they've had a couple of good nights but it's never like he did anything controversial he's always in the media you know he's rolling out of here he's slagging people off he's got like he's just a that seems like just a down-to-earth athlete and probably now can retire without the pesting of paparazzi in the media do you know what i mean so Good luck to you. Eddie Hearn, thank you for your time. Good luck with your show in Philly tomorrow. And uh, yeah, we'll catch you. Cheers, mate. See you soon.